The monster taming genre has been getting wifely these past few years, especially in the indie scene. And now, after four years of work, a successful Kickstarter and a lot of hopes and dreams, Studio Aurum has released its own project on Steam's early access program. Previously known as Crowns, Monster Crown is the work of a group of friends led by a Canadian fellow named Jason Walsh. Jason has always been fascinated by the monster taming genre, and a major inspiration comes from Pokemon, but not how you might expect it. Monster Crown takes inspiration from the unused concept art for Capsule Monsters, Game Freak's initial pitch for a monster game that would eventually become Pokemon, and the official artwork wears this inspiration on its sleeves. Like other fans of monster taming games, he grew up with other titles such as Dragon Quest Monsters and Telefang, and he wants to show the world that the genre goes far beyond just Pokemon. In fact, one of his inspirations for Monster Crown's breeding system comes from his disappointment at how Pokemon's breeding didn't result in unique crossbreeds. The game begins with picking the player's appearance, followed by your father doing a Professor Oak. He explains that you live in a world where humans and wild monsters exist, but some crafty people discovered a way of creating pacts that would benefit both sides. But he warns you that becoming obsessed with power may have a cost. Back in the present day, your father needs your help with some chores. He lends you one of his monsters, then goes over some of the basic mechanics. After that, he presents you with a comic book as a reward for your efforts. And in it is a shady personality test claiming that you could win your own monster. This is just a way to recommend you a starter. You're free to pick any from a selection of five, each belonging to one of the game's five monster types. And so, that tells you to spend some quality time with your new friend, picking fights with random monsters and biting their heads off. Once your starter grows a level, your father recognizes your ability as a monster tamer and sends you on an errand to deliver a present to the king of the humanism kingdom. And thus starts your adventure. Monster Crown is advertised as a darker take on the genre, and while the marketing and screenshots might set off red flags and undesirable memories of certain cringy Pokemon ROM hacks and fan games, I feel like that's doing a disservice to the world of Crown Island. Most games have a queer hierarchy where the tamer is the top and the monster is the bottom bitch. Monster Crown is closer to the Megami Tensei series where both sides don't typically coexist unless it's mutually beneficial. The art style might make it seem like a happy-go-lucky world in the vein of Pokemon, but the setting and atmosphere is more grounded and pragmatic. It's a world where the creatures pose a danger to those who don't treat them with respect and the population suffers from similar problems to our own. But it's not like everyone else wants to rip your guts out while smoking weed and killing babies. Aside from a red-haired Edgeward and a cunt face getting his chest desserts, the game isn't as grim dark as the impression you might get from the marketing. The minute-to-minute -minute gameplay is fairly standard. You explore different areas, meet different people, solve different problems and fight different monsters. Monster Crown employs roaming monsters that wander around the overworld and chase after you. Touching them initiates a battle and you send out one of the monsters in your party. Battles follow a turn-based format where both sides fight each other until one is knocked out. Winning battles earns experience points for your monsters, letting them grow in level and acquire new moves. You can also choose whether to spread experience points between all party members or just the participants. Monsters and their moves belong to one of five types, each being 50% more effective against one type and receiving 50% less damage from another. Will beats Brute, which beats Malicious, which beats Unstable, which beats Relentless, which beats Will. Monsters can have up to six moves at a time. There is no limited number of uses and there is no hit chance to worry about, but different moves do make use of different stats to calculate damage, similar to the physical special split in Pokemon. 
During your turn, you can also tell your monster to defend for one turn, switch your active monster, use an item or attempt to escape, or just accept defeat like a little bitch. Defending and switching monsters also increases your synergy bar by one level. Your stored synergy is then automatically spent on your next offensive move, multiplying its damage. But keep in mind that synergy is reset when your active monster is knocked out or when the battle ends. This mechanic adds an extra layer of strategy to what is otherwise a rather simple combat system, and indeed certain boss battles will screw you over if you let the opposition charge it up and use it to boost their stats or to smack your party around. Outside of battle, you can do your usual exploring, with a bit of roguelikeness thrown into the mix. The maps are static, but throughout them are randomly generated items with various effects, and also random NPC tamers that you can fight for money and experience or trade monsters with. Certain NPCs in towns will heal your party for a price, but you can also establish a camp by using an item. You'll want to do this, because getting defeated means that you lose all the items you're carrying. One interesting mechanic is monster scouting. Basically, you target roaming monsters in front of you and attack them with your leader. If your team is powerful enough, the monster gets friggin' erased and you get the goodies. If it's not, the monster takes some damage but comes charging at you to start a battle. The game's big selling point is its breeding mechanics, and they are a bit like Dragon Quest monsters or Megami Tensei, but on steroids and without giant penis monsters. First, you need, well, monsters, which you can recruit by beating the crap out of them and using a packed item until they accept. You then set one monster as the primary and another as the secondary. After doing the thing, an egg is produced, which will hatch into a new monster after a while. You don't lose the parents, so breed away all you want until you get your own special abomination. The primary monster will pass down its attack, defense and speed stats, while the secondary will pass down magic, resistance and HP. The offspring will also inherit the moves of both parents. Genetic manipulation of some sort will also play a role. Right now, there's only one alternate gene available that produces different results, so that's something to look for in the future. The recent update also brought net eggs, which apparently lets you breed with a random egg that contains genes from players all over the world. Aside from sounding like a depraved sex act, this should be pretty interesting as more monsters get added to the game. And yes, online battling and trading is a thing too, but still very early in development. Calling it true crossbreeds might be overselling it just a little bit though. From what I understand, each monster has six forms. One is the basic form, and the other five belong to one of the five types. The offspring simply takes one of the five forms of the primary parent and the color scheme of the secondary. There are completely unique combinations, and I'm sure that there will be lots more in the final version. I'm just saying that, while there is a ton of different designs, you shouldn't expect them to be infinitely generated based on the parents. And speaking of final version, this isn't it, so yeah, there's gonna be problems. The developers have been very active on the Steam forums looking for feedback and helping with problems, and the beta branch has improved the number of things since launch. But there are still improvements that need to be made before the game leaves survey access. So here are some suggestions, starting with the big ones. My main complaint right now is playability. The bugs and the quirks with the interface significantly impact the experience, which is why I can't 100% recommend Monster Crown in its current state. I don't mean superficial bugs like the weird fade in and fade out that seems to come from skipping the title screen too fast, or the terrible word wrap, or your party leaders passing in and out of existence. I mean things like the experience bars being completely broken and not displaying the correct amount. Or that one time when both monsters were knocked out and the game didn't know what to do with it. 
the interface has a lack of consistency. Some screens use generic button labels like OK, Back, etc. But other places use specific keys or buttons like L1 or C, and they aren't updated if you change them. I'm playing on a controller with a custom control scheme, and I accidentally pressed the wrong buttons a few times until I got used to it. My suggestion would be to use the generic labels everywhere, avoiding situations where one menu says one thing and a different menu says another thing. The special functions like scouting and the canoe are also unnecessarily cumbersome. I don't know how many there will be in the end, but maybe scouting should get its own dedicated button since it's an important function. There isn't a need for two separate special function groups either, and the canoe could just be turned into a contextual action. I feel like the game could also communicate things better. It would be nice if the game told you when you finished all available story progress to avoid confusion when you see NPCs blocking your path. There are some spots that don't let you progress but also don't have anything to indicate it. I also found a monster with two asterisks in its name, which apparently means that all of its base stats are above average. There are two parts of the battle mechanics that I'm worried about, one being the synergy system. For boss battles it adds a layer of strategy, but it's sort of pointless for regular random battles since they don't last long enough for it to be worth using. It's in an awkward position, and I'm not sure how to improve it besides maybe making it carry over between battles. You might think that the solution would be to make every random battle into a complex tactical challenge, but there's a good reason why developers don't do it, and that's because the player would get tired very quickly, and simply getting from one point to another would take longer than it should. The other part is move balance. They use extremely low values, so there isn't a lot of room for variety and progression. For example, Pokémon has fire-type moves with many different powers, effects and drawbacks, with the strongest usually suffering from low PP or low accuracy. Monster Crown has none of these, which could result in some becoming obsolete or simply being clones of each other. Now for the less important things. For starters, there's a lack of oomph in certain bits. For example, the battle intro could be a bit faster and play a sound effect. There's also no sound effects in certain menus, and speaking of menus, they feel a bit sluggish and awkward, with things like the switching screen resetting when you exit the status screens, and also not showing the types of each monster even though that's where it would be the most useful. The transition between walking and running could be smoother, and making certain animations faster or skippable would also be great. The game poses the question of whether you will be a savior or an absolute penis face, but on the story so far there's no player agency, no dialogue options or anything. On that same note, the current 5 hour long story content ends right when you unlock breathing, which kind of dampens the excitement. Finally, it's a 2D game built around a fixed resolution, and non-integer scaling to higher resolutions causes inconsistent pixel sizes and shimmering. My suggestion would be applying some sort of pixel interpolation filter, such as the sharp bilinear preset that comes with RetroArch's default shader package. There's also something wonky going on with the frame pacing, causing small but constant stuttering. According to Rifatuner Statistics Surfer's frame time graph, there seems to be a dip every few moments, maybe pointing to something in the game's logic being out of sync with the screen's refresh rate or something. And now that I'm done tearing the game apart, I just want to say that maybe the game could have spent a few more weeks in polishing state before going into worry access, but given how responsive the development team has been, I'm confident that its problems will be resolved as development progresses. So while I'm not totally sure I'd recommend the game right now, the mechanics, the breeding and the art style are all in a very promising place right now, and I would definitely revisit it when it's complete. If you're a fan of the monster taming genre, you should definitely keep a close look on this game, for it may yet become a crown jewel.